Hey everyone, Colby Brown here. Now I'm here for the fourth and final video for this amazing landscape photography video series here with B&H, and today it is all about editing. We're gonna be talking about Lightroom, Photoshop, my general workflow process when I begin processing images, and give you guys a couple tips and tricks along the way. So for the most part, Lightroom is my main core stay when it comes to ingesting images into my system as well as doing some light edits, such as adjusting the basic elements of exposure. But some things Photoshop still is the king for, such as when you're blending images together, trying to do things with photo stacking, or generally just doing more advanced techniques. Either way, both Lightroom and Photoshop are core elements of my workflow process. So I welcome you guys here into my home studio. Let's go ahead and get started on the photos that we took yesterday. So once we have our images imported here into Lightroom, it's time to check for things like sharpness, make sure our compositions are good, make sure we don't have any out of focus images, and try to figure out exactly which ones we actually want to focus our attention on. Anytime I go to photograph a given scene, I don't want to process every single image that I take out there. I want to pick the ones that I think have the most promise and kind of move on from there. So as you go through each of these different images, it's important to kind of zoom in and look at the details, make sure things are tacked sharp, make sure you don't have too many distracting elements, and figure out which one you want to start with. Now right off the bat, this one and the next one are two images that I think have some of the most promise. These are landscape based images that are horizontal in nature and they have a bit of opportunity for us to play within the post processing side of things. Now this image was taken with the polarizer used at full capacity so that it really enhanced that water reflecting off of the pools below the waterfall at Dingman Falls. So this image I think has some of the most promise. It's taken horizontally with Dingman Falls. It has beautiful light. You have beautiful green reflected with some of the, the forest and stuff happening around it. And then the next image, which is where the polarizer was actually enhancing the reflected light, you can see that we get really nice reflection. So ultimately I think I actually want to process both of these and then combine them in Photoshop. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Now starting off here in Lightroom, we can go ahead and jump into the develop module in order to start doing some basic basic changes. Now for the most part here in Lightroom, I try to stick down to the basic elements of exposure, such as adjusting the shadows, whites, blacks, highlights, things you can find here in the basic panel. I don't want to do too much here in Lightroom because I tend to find myself doing much more processing in the Photoshop side of things because I find that some of those advanced tools give me a bit more leverage when it comes to really bringing that story out with these images that I'm trying to share with you guys. So if we adjust our shadows, pull them up a little bit, adjust for our whites, making sure we don't clip too much when it comes to the waterfall there. And then we can go ahead and bring down our blacks, give us a bit more contrast, further adjust our highlights, making sure that things don't clip too much, but we do want to have a bit more exposure here. So one of the most questions I typically get asked, as well as B&H in general, is what is the value in shooting raw images? So raw images are essentially unprocessed files, unlike JPEGs. So they're much larger, but you get a lot more play when it comes to how you can actually process your images. So if you're pulling up shadows or decreasing your highlights, you're gonna have a lot more room to work with. For most of my work around the world, I am almost purely shooting in RAW for that very reason, so that I have as much flexibility as possible in order to creatively bring out the story that I was trying to tell out there in the field. Moving down the line here on the basic panel, I'm gonna go ahead and skip texture clarity and dehaze because I'm gonna do all of those later on. But I do wanna play a little bit with vibrance just to give this image a touch of pop. So vibrance is a little bit softer than saturation, so I usually start with that, increasing that, or moving that slider to the right. And then for saturation, I might make some small adjustments, but again, I don't wanna push things too far early on in the post-processing side of things. As far as the second image, the image that we're focusing most of our attention when it comes to the actual reflection, there isn't too much that we actually have to do here because most of the rest of the color was found in that original image we wanna start with. But as I said, I want to actually combine both these images together to get the best benefits of the reflection in the light in the pool below, as well as for the rest of the image in that original shot. So what we're gonna do here is we are actually gonna go back to the library panel. We're gonna select both images and what you do is you right click, come down to edit in, and then drop down the very bottom, it says open as layers in Photoshop. Now again, what this is gonna do is essentially open both these images as simple layers into the same file in Photoshop, making the whole process of combining these images much easier. 
Now, once you have both images here in Photoshop as layers, it's important to make sure that the brighter layer, so the layer that has the polarization at full capacity, at full enhancement of that reflected light in the pools on the top. So what we're gonna do is simply drag that bottom layer to the top, which essentially makes it the top layer that is most visible. Now here I'm gonna show you a very easy way in order to combine these two images together. It's gonna to take just a couple seconds and it's gonna blow your mind if you're not very familiar when it comes to Photoshop or if you're not too used to blending images or layers together. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna select the lasso tool here in the top left-hand corner on the toolbar on the left. And then what we wanna do is we wanna trace around the area that we actually want to blend into the other image, the, uh, the, the image that doesn't have the polarization that is cutting the reflected light that looks a little bit better everywhere else. So that typically is a water pool found here at the bottom. So we can go ahead and just click and drag and start making kind of rudimentary, you know, following the lines as we go around this image. It doesn't have to be perfect because I'll show you why in just a second. So once we trace the water here, we did a pretty good job. What we need to do is go down here to the bottom right hand corner and there's a little button right here that says add layer mask. Because we have a selection made, it's gonna create a layer mask based on this selection. So once I press that button, it creates a layer mask and essentially means that what we're gonna do now is that it's gonna see through the rest of the image, all the stuff that was outside that lasso tool area that we had selected and it's gonna bring those two elements together. Now the problem that we typically get when you layer images together is that it looks unnatural because you have those hard edges where you have one, one layer from one image and another layer from another. So what we're gonna do here to make it very simple is you actually just click on the layer mask itself in the bottom right hand corner. We're gonna go ahead and look on view properties and it opens up this little panel here on the right hand side. And the tool that is your, gonna be your best friend is found right here under the feather slider. So what feathering does is essentially it feathers that hard line edge to smooth it out and make it much more of a gradual transition between the two layers of the two different images. So when we click on that layer, so when we click on that feather slider, we go ahead and move it to the right, it's gonna naturally blend things together, as you guys can probably subtly see here. Now one of the best ways to see exactly how this works in process is we can actually go ahead and go back to what we originally had with feather. You can hold down the alt, or I believe it's command on a Mac and go ahead and click on the layer mask itself. So this is the area that what was in white is the essentially the light that was reflected from the pool below that we wanted to layer into the other image. And as you can see, it has these hard line edges. So when we adjust this feather slider, we really are just smoothing out those hard line edges to make them look much more natural. So this is the end result of the actual layer mask itself. So we go ahead and hit Alt or Command and go back to our original. Then it becomes much more of a natural gradation as you're actually blending these images together. So if we go ahead and click on the visibility of the top layer, you can see this is our original when we don't have that reflected light. And this is when we actually combine both of those layers together. And then we use the feather tool in order to smooth out that layer mask that we created. Now, once we're done here, we can go ahead and copy all of these layers and create a new layer because everything is kind of dialed in. And then from here, if you want to, you can actually jump back into Lightroom if you're more comfortable doing ge general basic edits. Uh, if you're comfortable with Photoshop, you can actually use the Adobe Camera Raw plugin, which is essentially Lightroom code for code. So it looks a little bit different, as I'll show you guys right here. But essentially, it is a great tool in order to do some of these basic edits and bring out some of the, the different tools and techniques that you might be used to with Lightroom, but you don't want to jump back into Lightroom just yet from Photoshop. So once we're here, like I said, visually it's gonna look a little bit different, but you're gonna have all of that same functionality of Lightroom. So on the right-hand side, you have our basic panel, which is the same one we just played with just a few minutes ago. And then moving down the line, you have all that same tools, adjusting your curves, your details, color mixer, color grading, all sorts of fun stuff in here. So what I wanna do is play around a little bit more with the colors really quickly, because I think I wanna bring out some of the hues found in the forest and the shrubbery found around Dingman Falls here. So let's go ahead and go down to Color Mixer. And then from here, this is essentially the old HSL panel that you might be used to in Lightroom or even in Photoshop. So HSL stands for hue, saturation, or luminance. So you can adjust each of the different variants when it comes to different colors of hue. So because of the green and the shrubbery found around the Dingman Falls, we want to adjust both the green and the yellow hues that you might actually find here in this image. So let's go ahead and start with luminance so we can kind of figure out exactly what type of color that we're working with. 
So here we can go ahead and go into luminance, find the yellow slider, and then go ahead and move it up and down. You can kind of see the small changes between the light that's happening around the waterfall itself. So if I push it up too far, it seems to clip light a little bit. If I pull it back down, it gives us a nice little green color there. So let's go ahead and do that. And then let's go ahead and pull up our greens itself. Kind of adjust, see where we where our happy place is. Now, overall, I think I actually want to mute these just a little bit in terms of luminance. And if it looks a little bit flat, don't worry too much about that, because we're going to fix that in a second when we jump over to saturation. Here in saturation, we're going to go ahead and take that green slider and just pop it up a little bit, allowing those greens to kind of pop and stand out. And then we're going to do the same thing with yellows. So what we did is we adjusted the luminance, which essentially is the brightness of those color hues, making them a little bit not as bright. We kind of pulled back that brightness, and then we increased the saturation, which is kind of the color punch found in each of those two different color hues. Now overall, we don't have too many other different color variations here because we've got a lot of earthy tones and a lot of really nice mid-tones. So from here, we can actually go ahead and go to the detail panel. This is where we can adjust for sharpening. So there's certainly more advanced ways that you can sharpen an image, but for today's purposes, we can go ahead and adjust our sharpening slider, which is gonna pay a bit more attention to the detail found in the midtones. So if you wanna check to see how sharpening is applying to your image, you can go ahead and zoom in by clicking on an area where you have a lot of midtones, such as the rocks here, just to the right of Dingman Falls. And then you can adjust this slider to the left or to the right, and you can kind of see how it sharpens those details. Now it's important that you don't want to sharpen things too much because a image that has too much sharpening can create artifacts and make it look unnatural. So you kind of want to do small, simple adjustments when it comes to sharpening. Both sharpening and saturation are something that new photographers tend to push a bit too far. So you do want to be a bit more careful when it comes to using these sliders in either Photoshop or Lightroom. Once you're done, you can go ahead and zoom back out. We can go ahead and click the OK button, which is going to take us right back to Photoshop. And once we're here, let's go ahead and make this image a bit larger. And then we can go ahead and click on the visible layer for what we had just applied. And you can see that was before and that was after. Just adding a little bit of color adjustment to the different greens, the yellow hues found in the shrubbery around the falls, and adjusted a little bit of sharpness found into the midtones within the image. Now one thing I want to do here before we stop is actually remove some of the distracting elements that I didn't have an option to control when I was actually out there in the field, which we talked about in the last video. Now normally I would try to remove you know, sticks or leaves or things that got in the way, but I just wasn't able to hop over, that, uh, hop over the fence and try to get down there and clean up the water. It was just impossible and it's again something that we don't want to do when it comes to landscape images. We want to respect the guidelines of the areas that we're in and try to keep things just as it was before we got there. So this is something that we have to do in Photoshop to remove some of these distracting elements. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and zoom into the water here where we have some more of these distracting elements. And we're going to try to find the pieces that are a bit more brighter. Now down here you see some of the movement happening in the water. That was essentially leaves that were moving around as the water was flowing. And some of these, especially the brighter ones, are a bit more distracting that I want to keep in the image itself. So what we can do is come back here to the toolbar on the left hand side and we want to find this, the spot healing brush. So we click on it, we have the ability to essentially use Photoshop and its algorithm in order to remove pixels that we don't want and replace them with pixels uh, found in your image that are right nearby, so it looks very natural. And all we need to do is go ahead and find these bright spots, go ahead and click on them, and Photoshop does all the magic for us, removing some of these distracting elements. Now if we come over here, we can zoom in a little bit further to maybe these sticks became more distracting for you, as they are for me. So we can go ahead and go back to our spot healing brush and we can kind of paint in the areas that we want to, to remove. Now what I found through my experience of using this tool is that you really want to work or focus your attention on small areas and not make the area that you're painting in to remove too big because what happens is it's trying to find too many pixels in order to replace and sometimes it can have adverse effects that don't look too natural. And you have to spend more time cleaning up the area that you just did a spot healing brush on rather than if you just went slowly and did it piece by piece like we just removed the, those sticks that were found in the water. Now as we move forward, we can continue on. Let's see here, painting in some more of these areas, cleaning them up. We don't have to remove every small piece, but some of the ones that stand out and cause people to kind of look and, again, get distracted. That's the whole point when it comes to cleaning up these images. You want to make sure that people have the most, that most of their attention is focused on what you want, which in this case is the waterfall itself, not the leaves that were happening here in the reflected pool. Now 
Now, once you're happy with the results, we can go ahead and zoom back out just a little bit. And then we can go ahead and click back on that layer that we were just on. And you can see some of the pieces here in the water at the very bottom that kind of come back to life because it was all happening just on a layer. It's the benefit of Photoshop is that you get to use layers rather than a Lightroom where everything is non-destructive, but it's kind of one-off adjustments. Here we can apply multiple different adjustments to a single layer, such as Spot Healing or Adobe Camera Raw. And then we can turn on or off the power of each of those different techniques that we just applied to that individual layer. But you can see, again, that's the clean version and the edited version through Adobe Camera Raw. And that's what we originally had to work with once we actually blended those two images together. So once we're happy with these results, go ahead and click on File and Save. And what this is going to do is this is going to save our image, save this original RAW file as a, as a TIFF file, which is essentially is a lossless file format for our images that we can always come back and re-edit and further make adjustments to what we're doing. But it's going to send that file back into Lightroom where we can go ahead and go back, and then it's going to replace, uh, or it's going to create a new image for us, saving those two original files in the process. So this is the original raw file that we had to work with, as well as the brighter one, which was the polarized version. And then this is our image that we uh, began to process and create. So after 15 years of being a photographer, traveling around the world, photographing all sorts of things, I have to say that landscape photography is one of my favorite genres of photography because it gives me the ability to connect more with nature. Now overall, it was my goal with this video series that you gained a bit better understanding and a bit better respect for landscape photography. Now when we're out there in nature, it is imperative, it is very important to make sure that you leave no trace. When you're walking on marked paths, stay on those paths. Don't jump over fences just because you think it's going to give you a better shot. There were plenty of times when I was at Dingman Falls where I was looking at different compositional opportunities that I thought might have been better than the ones that I had, but I didn't take advantage of them because that would mean that I'd have to cross over that border and potentially damage some of the environment around me. This is important for future generations, like my son who's 10 years old who wants to experience these things as well. The more we can protect things now, the more other people can enjoy them later on. Well, that's a wrap here for our fourth and final video for this landscape photography video series. We spent so much time out in the field talking about the different techniques and the basic core elements of landscape photography, talking about gear and lenses and all the accessories. But the post-processing side is something that, again, I think a lot of people tend to overlook. So I hope you picked up a couple tips and tricks here that it can help make your landscape images much better in the process. So after watching this video, if you guys still have comments about landscape photography or if you have ideas of what you guys want to see next for this series, I'd love to see it in the comments below. If you guys want to find more information about myself and all the travels that I have working around the world, you can find it at colbybrownphotography.com or on Instagram at colbybrownphotography. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time.